Wide World on Money FM 89.3. What is the deal with AI? We, we've all been talking, especially since uh, November, so when Chat GPT really mm. kind of came out of uh, came out of the woodwork in a in a very consumer oriented way. But AI has been around for many decades now, as we know. And um, the the interest in it now, though, is is really spreading very quickly and taking us into um, a place that we haven't seen in terms of technology since really the dawn of the Internet. Uh, we have a very special guest joining us now from the west coast of the U.S., from California. Jeff Herbst is the founding managing partner of GFT Ventures. Uh, he was also involved for many years at NVIDIA, uh, the graphics card people, uh, talking about um, AI, data science, autonomous machines. He, he knows it all, and he's with us now to share. Uh, Jeff, great to have you with us. Thanks for joining us on your Friday evening. Yeah, thanks, Glenn. Good to be with you again. And Neil, it's great to meet you as well. Yeah, Jeff, there's so much we can talk about uh, when it comes to AI. But let's let's get into the what we all have been seeing lately, which is the consumer, the real consumer facing uh, part of AI with ChatGPT, with now Bard coming out uh, with um, uh, with Google's product, uh, Jasper AI, uh, I've been using uh, for a, a year myself. Where are we at right now with this evolution of AI and how the public is interfacing with it? Well, I think we've uh, reached a groundbreaking moment with respect to AI. And let me give you a little history to kind of elaborate there. It was around 2012 that researchers and scientists uh, you know, using this thing called AlexNet were able to prove that a uh, AI-based convolutional network could identify pictures in that case, dogs and cats, better than any computer vision algorithm. And this is kind of what started the modern revolution of AI. And I think you mentioned it. And I, I believe we've talked about this together before. This technology has been around for a long time. It's not new. Mm. Even ChatGPT has been around. But the problem was there just wasn't enough computing horsepower uh, mm. to, to actually build the algorithms, train the models in our lifetimes. I mean... It would have taken, you know, light years to do it, you know, 20 years ago when, when I studied it in uh, college. And uh, so I think computer vision took off in a big way from 2012 to 2022. And I think what, what just happened in December with the, the, the widespread adoption, I think 100 million people already using ChatGPT. So something like the fastest adoption curve of any technology ever is we broke ground on something remarkable in natural language processing. So imaging was great, but language really wasn't solved. And, you know, like I said, you know, it, it wasn't necessarily the models that um, OpenAI built. It was the way they produced it and the way they presented it and the way you were able to interface with it that finally opened it up to the public and to the consumer. And now I believe we've just, uh, hit the second big bang moment of, of AI. And it, it's really exciting for me because I've been doing this for years and I've just been waiting for everybody else to catch up. It is fascinating, Jeff, and you've touched on the hardware making it more compatible for the consumer. But something has changed in the consumer as well, I feel, in the last month. Something psychologically has changed. You know, we grew up with our Space Odyssey movies and our Terminator movies, and AI was bad, AI was destructive. But that has definitely changed psychologically. We just saw recently that the International Baccalaureate, the IB, will now accept the use of chat GBT in the classroom. So it's, it's being seen, we can debate whether it's a force for good, we can talk about that, but psychologically, it seems to be a much more positive tool for consumers. Why do you think that attitude has changed and changed so dramatically and quickly? Well, I think it's like you say, I mean, we've made it in a, in a way that the average person can actually see some benefit from it. So my son, who's a student, I mean, we were sitting around over the holidays, and I said, you know, you ought to try this. I mean, maybe when you apply to college, this will help you build the first draft of your essays. And his eyes lit, lit up wide, and he's, he tried it, and he couldn't stop playing with it. So I think we've finally gotten over this, you know, return of the Terminator, or not return, whatever you want to call it. This is actually, these AIs can actually assist us in building our uh, artwork, you know, 
You know, what yeah. if I want to build a logo for my company? And we've finally seen enough applications that are not just sitting in the cloud, kind of creeping us out. Like, you know, the first applications of modern AI were these recommendation systems by Netflix and Google and Facebook. You ever wonder yeah. how they know that you ought to be friends with this person or you ought to buy this product? A lot of that's using AI. And, you know, that's all great. And it may those books a lot of money, but it really was hard for us as consumers to kind of touch something that really helped us. And I think chat GPT may be the first thing where people said, wow. And it was kind of that moment and it's changed public perception. And like you say, there could be some issues around that coming, but I think for now we're accepting of it and uh, we're realizing, you know, we should, we should accept it as consumers. And by the way, every enterprise uh, infotech person in the world is being lectured by their CEO at the moment <laughs> saying, hey, how is AI going to affect our business? What software should we build? What software should we yeah. buy? And so when that happens, it just creates this huge flywheel. Mm. Well, and our kids, you know, my kids and, and I'm sure Neil's daughter, you know, already starting to use it in school. Teachers are, uh, I think the advanced teachers are realizing we can't just say, no, don't use it. We have to figure out smart ways for our students to How access to it. it. Yeah, as you mentioned, Jeff, with your son. And we are talking with Jeff Herbst, founding managing partner, GFT Ventures. Uh, I, wanna, I do want to talk to you in a, in a moment about GFT Ventures and what you're doing in the venture capital space and AI. But first, before we do that, I know one of the topics that you talk quite eloquently on, Jeff, is that of ethics. Um, AI ethics. And we've seen uh, a number of, of really, really crazy things happen it, just in the past six months in terms of inappropriate um, AI responses to people. I was just reading about a, a, a law school professor who was just, um, uh, who was just accused by, uh, by an AI algorithm of, of having uh, been inappropriate with a student on a trip to a place, to a place he'd never been, to a university he'd never worked at, and and uh, you know, and a, and a person he never knew. So these things are popping up from an ethical standpoint. What is, is the world any closer to coming to any sort of agreement on what the ethics should be around these very consumer-facing AI products? I don't think we are actually, and. I think that's okay because we're really just getting started. I think um, we're, if, if I was going to use a baseball analogy, we're not even in the, the, the first half of the first inning of AI as far as I'm concerned. But, you know, the, 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 a lot of people are creeped out by AI because they don't understand it. In fact, what a lot of these AIs are doing is they're just doing pattern recognition on huge amounts of data. And the reason we as humans can't, simulate these algorithms in our head is because they're looking at, you know, gigabytes, you know, tons and tons of pictures, images, text. And so the, most people don't understand it. They think it just, the AI is just doing something kind of really creepy. But in fact, the AI is recognizing patterns from the past and making mm -hmm. recommendations for the future. And mm -hmm. so if you think about like ethics and bias, you know, sometimes the things that happen in the past are not necessarily what you want to happen in the future. You want to create new things. And I think that's one of the problems. Like, you know, if you think about within an enterprise, for an enterprise to use some of these tools, we have to make sure that it's, it's enterprise grade, that there's no bias in how the AI responds because, you know, there are laws and regulations around discrimination, um, use of IP, and another thing people don't think about is we've moved from an era where, you know, computer computing was based on coding, you know, right, billions, millions, lines of code. That's how you created value. We've shifted to an era where data does the programming and essentially the data and massive amounts of compute by my former uh, company, NVIDIA, are creating most of the value and they're creating the algorithm. So, you know, I was telling this to my business partner earlier this week. We don't let people steal our computer code. We better not let people steal our data. The data, like everyone mm. always said, data is the new oil. Data, yeah. it really is at this point because that's the, that's the thing that's going to separate um, one company or one person from the others. How much data do you have to train your AI? Because that's where it's going to get the knowledge and that's where it's going to recognize the patterns. Hmm. And it's a great point, Jeff, because that is arguably the greatest fear 
regarding AI, isn't it? Because you mentioned, in essence, what is it? It's gathering information, finding patterns. But that was used by the likes of Cambridge Analytica mm -hmm. with Brexit, arguably with the Trump elections. There's been all kinds of reports regarding Russian hacking, influencing elections all over the world. So how do we bring in any form of ethics or control or code to at least manage that when the data is harvested for what can only be called nefarious means? Right, because you know, if I'm recognizing patterns from data, if I put all this fake data out on the internet and the AIs are training on that data right. and I ask it a question, it's going to answer. So here's, I was actually thinking about this earlier today. Like, how are we going to deal with this? And I know there was an open letter written recently by a bunch of industry luminaries. I forget what the name of the letter is. At least a thousand people signed it saying, we need to stop development of some of these technologies until we, we figure this out. Honestly, I don't think that's possible. And I'm not sure that everyone who signed that letter has the same, you know, good intentions. But we, we definitely need, need to solve it. But, you know, I don't know, you know, I don't live in Singapore, so I don't know if people run around with guns. I, I bet they don't. It's only in America that people do that, right? But the fact right. of the matter yes. is, the, the gun, the gun, yeah, we, it's only in America that we have to wake up and listen You've to this You've got the market nonsense. cornered on that. Let's see what yeah, you say. I mean, <laughs> but, you know, this is, this is what we grew up with. And, but, you know, there are responsible gun owners and users, but, the gun isn't the gun is a very powerful weapon, but we have regulations that hopefully stop people from using it for for bad intentions. I believe the same has to be true of these AI because it's as someone who grew up programming a computer, building computers, it's just technology. It's just the next advancement of technology. We've been able to regulate technology as much as possible. I mean, you can argue that we don't do a very good job with social media already. We still can't figure out, you know, what should be allowed and what shouldn't be allowed. But I think what has to happen is we can't stop technology. Like anybody who's ever tried to stop technology has lost that battle. I mean, the people that own the horses and the carriages wanted to stop the automobiles. That didn't work out too well for them. And it turned out to create more jobs and more things for people to do. I think we have to start the dialogue among us as industry veterans and uh, among regulators. And I think we, it's up to us at this point to do, do things as responsibly as possible. But to keep the bad people away, definitely we're going to have to start to regulate not just the ethics around this, but also the intellectual property. Because it's a different way of looking at intellectual property when you're, when you're saying, you know, I train these AIs using data. But what if the data kind of has morphed three or four times since I created it? Is it still my data? Is it your data? So, uh, and, and I talked to a lot of legal people about this as well, and they're just licking their chops, getting ready for all the, all the different things that are going to happen. But, but I, I, to answer your question really simply, we're not there yet. We're not even close. But we, this is great that we're talking about it, and um, we'll mm. figure it out together. But we can't stop it. Jeff, let's talk about GFT Ventures. Uh, it's a, um, a rel relatively new venture capital fund that you're starting in the AI space primarily. Uh, where are the opportunities for investors, for people that are looking to get involved in, in the money side of this amazing ecosystem? Well, it's going to be huge. And th this was a dream of mine for many years. And I think you mentioned earlier, I spent 20 years running business development for NVIDIA. So... I built their venture capital program. I ran their mergers and acquisitions. And I also built their inception startup program, which people know in, in Singapore, which has over 13,000 members and worked with all these different companies. So I knew there was going to be explosion of applications that used AI. And so obviously, big beneficiary first, my former company, NVIDIA, up and to the right. I mean, like I said earlier, when computer code can now be created or algorithms instead of being created by code can be created by compute you know microprocessors gpus and data there's a heck of a lot of value that goes into the compute and the system and the storage and the data center so there are going to be a lot of big beneficiaries for investors there personally i'm still i'm still an investor in all those companies including nvidia but i wanted to go focus on the new applications in ai and the startups are going to lead the way. This is what I feel because whenever you have a huge technology shift like this, the big incumbent companies are a little bit slower because 
they, they have to reinvent themselves. So GFT Ventures was formed by me and my partner, Jay Un, and we raised $120 million. Uh, we're actually still raising a little bit of money. Uh, we're going to finally close the fund at, at the end of June. So we're still accepting some more money. But we, we, we felt like the next 10 to 20 years, we're going to be up and to the right in terms of the opportunity for startups. So we go in early. We roll up our sleeves. We find the best ideas. We work with the best entrepreneurs who are solving the hardest problems for the best for the biggest and best markets. And we want them to be using AI and data science in some way to do that. And because there's so many opportunities, our inbox is just flooded all day long with mm. opportunities to invest in startup companies. And and that's why we started. And so far, it's going great. So I'm mm. I'm, I'm super. And and yeah. And by the way, when we started it, there was no Chat GPT. Nobody was talking about that. I knew there was a Chat GPT because Google had come up with these large language model or transformer models way back in I think 2000. 17, 18, they, they, they released them. I couldn't figure out why nobody was using it. So everything that I thought was going to happen has now happened. And, and it happened right when we had the fund already funded and, and up and running with eight investments. Good Fascinating. timing. Yeah. Well, Jeff, on that, I'm not expecting you to give away trade secrets unless you want to for the benefit of our <laughs> listeners. But as you said, we're on the ground level. There's going to be an explosion of of startups in the coming years, where should investors potentially look in such a wide open field? Yeah, well, you know, one of the first big applications was in uh, autonomous driving and driver assistance. I know that's really big in Singapore, and I think that's mm -hmm. still going pretty well. It's slowed down a little bit, um, but now the AI is moving into all these other, you know, huge uh, fields. For example, uh, healthcare, huge opportunity. Uh, in AI. I'm working with one company, um, I think I mentioned it uh, to you, Glenn, before, called Artisite, uh, which is basically wiring up every hospital with cameras and sensors to create efficiency. Because one of the biggest problems in hospitals, at least in the U.S., they don't have enough manpower, woman power, person power. You know, they can't basically service all the patients. So they have to become more efficient. And this is kind of low-hanging fruit. So that's a great um, area. All areas of manufacturing can be made uh, more efficient. Um, you know, retail, whenever you buy anything, there's opportunities mm -hmm. to make your consumer experience more pleasant. Um, uh, you know, any kind of creation of content is going to be helped by AI. This is what ChatGPT does. This is what DALI does. You know, if I'm able to create, you know, a presentation or create, you know, uh, you know, a, a business card or whatever I'm doing much, much quicker, AI is going to help. So we think it's going to span across all verticals, uh, all horizontals. And uh, so that's where we see it. it. Every business model is going to be disrupted by uh, AI. And if it hasn't already happened, it, it's about to happen. Jeff, fascinating conversation. We do definitely want to keep in touch with you and have you on again. We have to leave it there for now, though. Uh, Jeff Herbst, founding managing partner, GFT Ventures, joining us from the West Coast, San Francisco area. Thanks for being with us today on Money FM, Jeff. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm going to go eat my dinner, and uh, <laughs> I, I may, it, it probably doesn't include insects, but you never know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, not not uh, not advertently, maybe inadvertently, but we'll hope not. <laughs> Another industry on the ground level. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, there All you right, go. thanks, Jeff. Thanks Have a good night. Having... Okay, bye bye. Saturday morning on Money FM eighty nine point three.